So in this video we're going to discuss the monotone convergence theorem. This is a theorem in calculus and real analysis about the convergence of monotone sequences of real numbers. So let's start by saying what is a monotone sequence of real numbers. So there are two types. There are monotonically increasing sequences and monotonically decreasing sequences. And this theorem really can be split into two parts. One part about monotonically increasing sequences and one part about monotonically decreasing sequences. And those two parts are the mirror images of one another. So proving one of them will then give the proof for the other because it's the mirror image case. So we're only going to need to prove one and we'll do the one for monotonically increasing sequences just because everyone prefers things going up than things going down. So firstly, what is a monotonically increasing and a monotonically decreasing sequence? So let's say we've got some sequence of real numbers. So A1, A2, A3. So as usual, I'm going to start my sequences from uh, the index 1 rather than the index 0 just because that's my personal preference to call the first term A1 rather than A0. Um, so to be monotonically increasing means that for all n is an element of the natural numbers, a n plus 1 is going to be greater than or equal to a n. And what that means is that if you look at successive terms, so we could start here and compare a1 to a2, a2 is going to be the bigger of the two, so I can stick whatever natural number I like in here, apart from obviously 0, because we don't have a 0 term, because I haven't started there. Uh, but for all the other ones, so if you like, you could subtract off 0 there, if I'd left enough space, we could have bar 0. So if we put in n is equal to 1 here, we'll get that A2 is greater than or equal to A1, if we put in n is equal to 2, we'll have a3 is greater than or equal to a2. So that means that this one is bigger than this one, and so on. The one here will be bigger than the one here. The one here will be bigger than the one here. So every single successive term is greater than or equal to the previous one. That is what is meant by a monotonically increasing sequence of real numbers. And then you can guess what monotonically decreasing is going to mean. Just a small point, it is a less than or equal to symbol here, not strictly greater than. So I haven't insisted on this, the strict inequality. There is a separate name for a sequence where the terms are increasing strictly in that way, and we call it a strictly increasing sequence. Of real numbers and this theorem that we're going to discuss here doesn't actually require them to be quite that strongly related. Of course all strictly increasing sequences are monotonically increasing sequences but then there are monotonically increasing sequences that aren't strictly increasing. So our theorem is going to be about that broader type of monotonically increasing sequences rather than this smaller class of strictly increasing sequences. So just an example then of a monotonically increasing sequence. So a really simple example would just be take a n is equal to n. So this is the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. That's actually a strictly increasing sequence, but all strictly increasing sequences are monotonically increasing. And you can see that each successive term is bigger than the previous one. And this is an unbounded monotonically increasing sequence because it's getting out of controlly big. So now monotonically decreasing then means that all the terms are getting successively smaller. So for all n is an element of the natural numbers, bar 0 because I don't want to include that one. Uh, the next term along, a n plus 1, is now going to be less than or equal to a n. So um, a2 is going to be less than or equal to a1 a3 is going to be less than or equal to a2, a4 is going to be less than or equal to a3, and that's monotonically decreasing. And likewise, if we made it stronger, if we made it a strict inequality, that a n plus 1 was strictly less than a n, then that would be strictly decreasing as opposed to monotonically decreasing. And again, the, monotonically, the monotone convergence theorem is going to be about this broader type of sequence monotonically decreasing rather than having to be strictly decreasing. So both monotonically increasing and monotonically decreasing sequences are called monotone sequences. 
Now, the monotone convergence theorem, the two parts, one is for monotonically increasing sequences and one is for monotonically decreasing sequences, but they are mirror images of one another. So we'll state the theorem for monotonically increasing sequences, we'll prove it for monotonically increasing sequences, but everything is just the mirror image for monotonically decreasing sequences. So let's start then with this theorem for monotonically increasing sequences. So it says that if you have a monotonically increasing sequence that is bounded above, then you can conclude that that sequence is going to converge to a limit. So that's a very useful, very powerful theorem. So we now need to add this additional um, criteria in. So there must exist some upper bound for the sequence, so some real number, so some u, that's an element of the real numbers, such that u is greater than or equal to all the terms of the sequence, so a n for all n is an element of, and again, I was just going to write natural numbers, but um, strictly we will take the natural numbers without zero in, because we're not including that zero term. So this one fails that additional criteria. There is no upper bound, there's no real number that's greater than or equal to every single natural number. So this isn't bounded above, and therefore the monotone convergence theorem doesn't apply to this, and it's true, there isn't a limit in this case. However, if we draw a picture of what's happening here, so here's the real line, here is zero, and here is this upper bound for our sequence, then all the points of the sequence, if we start with A1 here, then A2 is here, A3 is here, so they're all getting bigger, or they're staying the same potentially, so A4 might be this, on top of A3, it might be the same point, but they're never going backwards, they're never going to the left, they're always just going rightward. So what this theorem is saying is that they must accumulate somewhere. Um, if you've got an infinite number of terms having to be packed into this finite interval here, or finite length interval at least, uh, then they end up accumulating somewhere, accumulating to a limit L. And we're going to prove that, and it is very, very simple to prove. In fact, we can even say what that limit L is going to be. It's going to be the supremum of all the terms of the sequence. So what we can do is we can put all the terms of the sequence into a set, so all the ANs, such that N is an element of the natural numbers, except zero. And then if we take the supremum of that set, now by the least upper bound axiom of the real numbers, because we know that this set is bounded above by this number u, then the supremum must exist. Any set with an upper bound has a least upper bound. That's one of the axioms of the real numbers. So we can be sure that this exists. And my claim is that I can show you that the sequence is in fact going to converge to that limit L. Now this relies upon the sequence being monotonically increasing. If you just have some sequence that isn't monotonically increasing, that has an upper bound, you can still find the supremum of the set of all the terms of that sequence. However, it's not going to be true necessarily that the sequence converges to that value. So for example, uh, to give a counter example, we could take the sequence that is the harmonic progression, one over n, the classic example, this is one, a half, a third, etc. So on a picture, here's zero, here's one, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller like so. So the supremum of the set of all the terms of the sequence is of course one, it's the maximum, but the sequence absolutely is not converging to one, it's converging to zero. So this absolutely relies on the fact that the sequence is monotonically increasing for uh, me to say that it's actually, its limit is going to be the supremum of the values. So let's show this now, let's show that this sequence is going to converge to this limit L. So I just need to show the epsilon definition of the limit. I need to show that the terms of this sequence get to and stay indefinitely close to the limit L, which is this supremum. So let epsilon be greater than zero then. And what we can do is imagine that epsilon interval around this supremum L now. So this is L plus epsilon, that's that bound of the interval. And this is L minus epsilon here. And I need to show that there is a big N such that 
at that term of the sequence and for all terms afterwards, they are going to be inside that epsilon interval. And then because it's a general epsilon, it will hold true for all epsilon and I'll satisfy the epsilon definition of the limit. So how do I find this big N then? Well, this is really beautifully simple. So look at this boundary of the epsilon interval, the lower boundary of the epsilon interval. So this is L minus epsilon. Now, because L is the least upper bound of this set, I know that L minus epsilon cannot be an upper bound for this set because it would contradict L being the least upper bound because all other upper bounds must be greater than or equal to the least upper bound. So L minus epsilon cannot be an upper bound. That means that there must be something in this set that is strictly bigger than L minus epsilon. So I can find you a term of the sequence, and we'll call that term of the sequence A big N, deliberately, um, which is strictly bigger than L minus epsilon. So there must exist a N is an element of the natural numbers such that A big N is strictly bigger than L minus epsilon, i.e. it's in there. And of course it's going to be sandwiched between L minus epsilon and L. So L minus epsilon is smaller than A big N, but it in turn is smaller than L because L is an upper bound for this set, so it's bigger than or equal to every element in it. Uh, so actually, I suppose really I should have bigger than or equal to there. So it's sandwiched in, it's like this picture shows, it's there. But now I claim that I can use this big N as the big N for my epsilon here, because all the successive terms for all the little n's afterwards, so for all, and I'll just make a bit more space down here, so for all little n that is greater than or equal to that big N, all of these terms afterwards, a little n, are going to be greater than or equal to a big N because of the fact that it's monotonically increasing. So they're all going to be inside here. We can also say that all the little a n's are going to be less than or equal to L, so they're going to be sandwiched in between a big N and L, and therefore they're also going to be forced to be inside this epsilon interval. So from that big N onwards, all of the terms are now going to be inside that epsilon interval, and therefore that big N satisfies exactly what I needed it to do, i.e. it's a term in the sequence where from that term onwards, all the terms are inside that epsilon interval. So just use that big N that we found by finding a point that had to be bigger than L minus epsilon. So beautifully simple argument. And as that works for every eps uh, for a general epsilon, it works for all of them. Hence, I can say that for all epsilon, I can find you a term in the sequence where from that term onwards, all the terms are that close, that epsilon closeness to the limit L. And therefore, the sequence does get and stay indefinitely close to the limit L and therefore does converge to it. So there's the proof that if you've got a bounded, monotonically increasing sequence, you can conclude that it converges to the supremum of all the terms of the sequence. So that's the monotone convergence theorem for monotonically increasing sequences. The mirror image of it for monotonically decreasing sequences is that you're going to need your sequence now to be bounded below, so you're going to need a lower bound. So confusingly, I'm now going to call this L for lower bound. So if we're dealing with a monotonically decreasing one, um, then we'll need there to exist an L, a lower bound, such that for all um, N is an element of the natural numbers bar zero, um, that a n is greater than or equal to the lower bound L. So it needs to be bounded below, and then that monotonically decreasing sequence is going to converge to the infimum, the greatest lower bound of the set of all the terms of the sequences. So remember, the least upper bound property, its mirror image, is the fact that there's a greatest lower bound for any, for any set that is bounded below. And the argument as to why a monotonically decreasing sequence is going to converge to 
its infimum is exactly the same as what we've had here for why a monotonically increasing sequence that's bounded is going to converge to its supremum. Again, because um, if we draw a quick picture to explain it again, just to revise the argument. So now we've got this infimum, which I'll call I here, and we've got this monotonically decreasing sequence, and we want to show that it's converging to that infimum. So because this is the greatest lower bound, when you take an epsilon interval around the infimum, then here the upper bound of that epsilon interval is i plus epsilon now. And because i is an infimum, i plus epsilon cannot be a lower bound, because otherwise it would contradict i being the greatest lower bound, because it's something greater that would be a lower bound. Uh, therefore, there must exist some term of the sequence that's strictly smaller than it, some a big n, and then because the sequence is monotonically decreasing, all the other terms after it are also going to be less than it, but they also have to be sandwiched between it and i because they can't be smaller than i because i is a lower bound. So they're all therefore going to be inside that epsilon interval. So here is your big n for that epsilon. So the exact same argument holds true for y, bounded below monotonically decreasing sequences converge to their infimum. And here's an example here, this harmonic uh, progression. This is a monotonically decreasing sequence. Every successive term is smaller than the previous one. In fact, it's a strictly decreasing sequence. And you can see that if you took the infimum of all the terms of the sequence, that's going to be value zero. And indeed, that is the limit of this monotonically decreasing sequence. An example of a monotonically increasing sequence that's bounded would be something, uh, I'm being quite boring, so I'll just take another harmonic progression. So we could just take 4 minus 1 over n, so that'll be, the first term will be 4 minus 1 over 1, which is 3, the next term will be 4 minus a half, which will be 3 and a half, the next term will be 4 minus a third, so 3 and 2 thirds. And you can see that gradually it's going to get closer and closer and closer to 4, so it's a monotonically increasing sequence, the supremum is going to be 4, and indeed that's what it's going to converge to. So on a picture, here is 4, here is 0, here's the first term of the sequence, 3, and then here's the next term, 3 and a half, then 3 and 2 thirds, and the distance between each term of the sequence, so the an, or the mod of an minus 4, so the distance between them is going to be 1 over n, so it's getting progressively smaller and smaller, uh, so it's going to converge to 4, uh, and that indeed is the supremum of all the terms of the sequence. So there's an example of a monotonically increasing sequence that's bounded above, so for example 5 is an upper bound for every single term, uh, and the supremum is 4 and it's converging to 4. So there you go, there are the two monotone, the two ver versions of the monotone convergence theorem, and it's a very powerful, useful theorem in calculus and real analysis. So for instance, when we have infinite series, and I might just actually write some of this down, so if we have an infinite series from, let's say, n is equal to 1 to infinity a n, if all the terms of the sequence, um, all the a n's are greater than or equal to 0, then this actually is going to relate to the limit of a monotonically increasing sequence of partial sums. So hopefully you're aware that the formal definition of what it means to find the value of an infinite sum is that you're actually looking at the sequence of partial sums. So this is actually a sequence S1, S2, etc., all the way up to Sn and onwards, where S1 is just the first partial sum, so it's just A1, S2 is the second partial sum, so it's A1 plus A2. S3 is the third partial sum, so A1 plus A2 plus A3. And then in general, Sn is, and this is a bad choice of index, because now I'm going to have to replace the index that I'm using for the sum. So it's from i is equal to 1 to n of ai. So I've just replaced the index from n to i, because I've used n again here. Um, so in general... Sn plus 1 is going to be Sn plus the An plus 1th term of 
the series. And if all the terms of the series are non-negative, then each one um, or the, each successive partial sum is going to be bigger than the previous one. So it's going to be a monotonically increasing sequence of partial sums. And the meaning of finding the infinite sum is really look at this sequence of partial sums and does this converge? If it does converge, then we can say that the infinite series converges and the value of it is the limit of this sequence of partial sums. So if we've got all non-negative terms in a series, then we're just dealing with monotonically increasing sequences and therefore we can conclude that the series is going to converge if the sequence of partial sums is bounded above because then by the monotone convergence theorem it will have a limit. So it amounts to showing that this is going to be bounded and then you've proven convergence. So that's an example of how we use the monotone convergence theorem to work out something that's very interesting, the value of infinite sums. Um, so thank you for watching, we'll end there.